Thank you so much um, for that very kind introduction. And of course, um, you know, thank you to Encarnacion for the invitation um, and to Shishek for all the work in the background and everyone else who I don't know about working in the background. I really um, appreciate it. Um, so I wish to, it's sort of a funny thing giving this talk, not there, but here. Um, which means that I would like to preface this with something that we here at the University of Alberta um, and across Canada always do, and that is with an acknowledgement um, that I'm giving this talk from my place as a settler scholar on Treaty 6 territory in what is now Edmonton, the gathering place of Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Saltu, and Ashabe, Inuit, and many other Indigenous people. We always begin our talks here with that recognition for the work that we do in the university is complicit in perpetuating the violence and exclusion done to Indigenous people. And it's important to remember that in, in every event and gathering. Um, so now I will try to share my screen. It's always the same with these things. And bear with me. How is that? Good. Great. Perfect. Um, do let me know. Uh, I will just do a quick sound check. Is the sound okay or would you like me to put headphones on? The sound is okay. Uh, no. Perfect. All righty. Then here we go. The crafting of a research question is the crafting of an ethics. This is the advice that my art historian colleague Natalie Lovelace gives to her BA students as they begin to test out their voices in research papers. This is such a valuable lesson, one that takes courage and time to fully realize. What is the accountability of the feminist researcher and to whom? That is my own ethically driven research question of late, which seems ever more urgent as we retreat into this digital reality in 2020. And it is here today in the digital that will sit for a while, literally in this format, but also in terms of topics. Contemporary feminist activism has gained in transnational popularity in the past few years, rapidly increasing in speed, reach, and urgency. The beginning for the German language context could be marked with 2013. This is a bit of a walk down memory lane. Um, all of you will remember a lot of this. A year which saw prominent discussion around the German branch of the Ukrainian sextremist group Femen creative responses to the Russian punk band Pussy Riot, and the mobilization through Alf Schreib, uh, as a manner of documenting everyday sexism, a hashtag which won the Krimo Online Award in that same year. In 2016, that visibility resonated internationally, a year dawning on mass sexual violence in Cologne and other Western European cities, a violence that also brought out anti-immigrant and refugee vitriol, but also the collective movement Ausnahmslos to fight back against sexism and racism. The Brexit debates and the US presidential elections in November 2016, as well as other political harbingers of the rise of the neoconservative popular right, have caused the public and popular face of feminism to undergo a radical shift. Like other countries around the globe, Germany and Austria's 2017 was marked by women's marches and pussy hats. Collaborative actions of solidarity have been visible and global even why they resonate and change locally, such as the 2017-2018 rise of Me Too. Even intersectionality is now indivisible from public conversations. Uh, in a talk in Edmonton last year, I believe it was, Anne-Marie Hancock Alfario notes that a quick Google search shows around 500,000 hits for the term intersectionality in 2015, compared to 6 million by 2017. And that's pretty telling. I didn't do the search for currently, but I think it's probably continuing on the rise. But through its digital circulation, the term is also consistently at risk of being co-opted and misrepresented by the broader public and academics alike. In response to this increased visibility, digital feminism as a field of research has received an uptick in academic attention. While much of this research takes a celebratory tack by highlighting the collective consciousness raising, and solidarity building effects of digital feminist work, that work must also be recognized as fractured and made up of uncomfortable bedfellows, as real life visceral embodiments, affects and experiences dovetail with their virtual counterparts. 
In their introduction to their 2019 co-authored book, Digital Feminist Activism, Caitlin Mendez, Jessica Ring Rose, and Jessalyn Keller write of the, quote, new formations of feminism and diverse feminist communities being reimagined and expanded through the use of new media. However, they also highlight the challenges that feminist scholars of digital media face, given the fluid and dispersed nature of these cultures and the violence inherent to the internet. In this, they underscore the complexity of practice in the use of and research on not only existing media and platforms, bring with them the patriarchal context in which they are created, but also those that are user generated and designed. Further, those high profile initiatives most often serving as case studies have developed within power and privilege structures of white, middle class, cisgendered, Christian, Western, able bodied women, rendering those developing beyond these structures invisible. But while the term digital feminism is most often used in the research with reference to social, social media uh, activism, for my research, it also encompasses creative works, digitally born, legible or responsive art, literature or video, materials and labor, such as coding, hacking and hardware, and communities of practice, feminist, queer and anti-racist makerspaces, as well as platform interactivity. These are situated within and agitate activist landscapes, as well as misogynistic vitrolic found on and offline. My current research asks how the plurality and the divisiveness in output, motivation, intent, research, and resonance of the various components that make up digital media-based feminism, including its embeddedness in virtual and visceral worlds, can be fought together. What might coalitional worlds look like that are built from disparate, competing, or even accidental activisms? How might collaborations emerge across non-coalitional creative communities of practice? Might we think of that non-coalitional collaboration in terms of relational proximity instead of some concept of belonging? I'm thinking here of a difference between coalitional non-collaborative work that is not working together toward a seemingly common goal, and non-coalitional collaborative work working together but towards seemingly disparate goals. Might a concept of an infrastructure built by affects emerging through activist work be productive for thinking about sustainable networked futures for both social justice and knowledge production? So what follows, I will not really answer these questions, but I will chase them. And maybe at the end, we can pursue answers together. And instead of a deep dive into one or specific examples, I will offer you a smattering of fairly random examples. And these are um, examples drawn from um, short talks I've given, but I'm trying to bring them together into conversation um, and with then the theoretical framing at the end. These will seem disconnected, but that's part of the point. So bear with me. I will start with a, two very different examples of artists' creative works drawn. Oh, sorry. I will start with a community of practice um, uh, context, and then we will take a brief discussion break uh, to then move on to um, artists' uh, creative works, uh, two, two examples of artists' creative works, um, after which we will again take a, a brief break, and then I will move on to what I call the comment section, and then into uh, some building out some infrastructural thinking to offer some initial headway into the concept of non-coalitional so we'll start with, and I have a slide that will be a break, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to get there fast. Um, so we start with a community of practice, and I use as my example Ms. Baitaza's laboratory, which is a feminist hackerspace founded in Vienna in 2009 by artist Stephanie Wuschitz. It is housed in a physical space, a building, but it is also highly mobile, popping up at locations around Europe. Feminist hackerspaces and geek communities such as Lab in Montreal or Double Union in San Francisco, and I'm sure there are many others, probably even some uh, located in and around Gießen, um, share a unification of maker cultures with intersectional feminism. Replicating the women's only cafes or coffee houses of the second wave, they are organized around a tool rather than an aim. In an article in DPI, Christina Haralanova uh, and Sophie Tupin write, quote, feminist hackers embody a political outlook on hacker culture and can re-politicize the somewhat cultural inclusive stance that has become more visible in the past years. 
Sorry, sorry. Just switch off your mics, please. Not Carrie, but the others, please. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Carrie. No worries. Uh, but always, no matter how often we do these things, we have to always remember to uh, switch off mics and figure out how to share things. So it's, it's, it's always a mystery. It will remain a mystery for everything. Um, so instead of simply encouraging more women to participate, they foreground a clear set of feminist principles. And this is specifically um, focused on including more women into hacker culture. But that applies also, of course, to um, many others. Um, in line with other hacker spaces, Ms. Baitazar's laboratory's mission statement describes the lab as an environment, um, sorry, an environment that fosters creativity, activism, and provocative thinking. They aim at generating a culture of ma uh, fearless making, sorry, of fearless making among female, queer, and trans artists. In their collaborative essay in Ada, um, Wuschitz and Selena Savage discuss the problems with feminist hacker spaces and what they create, despite their intention of avoiding exclusion as practices. The skills of technology, programming, tinkering, soldering, the building of prototypes, etc., are culturally coded as inherently masculine. Therefore, according to them, even when these skills enter the feminist maker space, they continue to read as masculine. Thus, feminist hackerspaces provide a community in which to demystify technology, create tools for feminist work, and collaborate through creation and hacking to shape both the access to interact, act, uh, interacting technologies and their cultural coding, which they call an infrastructure for gender performance. Infrastructure, they conclude, must be investigated as producing sites of meaning and calling attention to the construction of power through its representation. This would suggest that infrastructure visible, as it is often designed to be invisible, is key. Quote, we use the word infrastructure intentionally to denote an underlying set of facilities, tools, and relationships that feminist practice relies on. These are the systems, technical, administrative, operating in the background, that influence the active experience of the world. Bringing this infrastructure to the fore highlights the labor involved in social justice creative work in the digital sphere. At the same time, they claim that bodies in this visible infrastructure become invisible and unmarked, gender and race removed, so that makers are makers. And there are obvious problems with this suggestion of invisibility, since visibility matters. But this is, this is where they are. So as a hacker space focused on artists, developers, and designers interested in education, skills, and knowledge sharing for women-identified persons from different educational, cultural, and economic backgrounds, Ms. Baitazar's laboratory intends to be such an infrastructure. And while it is housed in a physical space, a building, it is also highly mobile and ephemeral. Infrastructure in this assessment should therefore be thought not only spatially, but also conceptually, as well as effectively. The resulting organization is not merely a shared living room which shelters from the weather and from harassment by young male geeks. It is also not simply a collection of soldering irons, LEDs, and Arduinos that a feminist hackerspace offers to makers. Its particular structure and setting creates and preserves material and immaterial output. The material includes manuals, instructions, tools, and objects, while the immaterial, the, quote, experience, gestures, norms, and values created in this environment which in turn foster the bending of normalized gender performance. Thus, when discussing what is made in the feminist hacker space, the directors of Ms. Baitazar's laboratory focus primarily on the performance of gender as related to speculative design, not the example of the object created within the lab. However, while their mission is intersectional and focused on open source technology, inclusive spaces, removing barriers and rethinking gender through collaboration, the members of Ms. Baitazar's laboratory do make objects by bringing together technology and art. Indeed, the leaders of the collective, along with the long list of friends, are all visual media or sound artists. Returning to Wuschitz's claim that infrastructure denotes the, quote, facilities, tools, and relationships on which feminist practice relies, this video introducing potential visitors to the lab, which I'm running here in the background, tells the story of just such an infrastructure giving it body, rendering it visible. 
with drawings by Wuschitz overlaid with title cards, dis cards discussing the importance of the work undertaken in the lab, as well as here examples of the kind of work um, being done around the world, the video works both to programmatically present the lab's feminist political mission, while also introducing the viewer and potential hacker to the lab's aesthetic and creative underpinnings. Short clips of workshops and artworks from around the world underscore the international reach of the hackerspace, moving it outside of the walls in which it currently resides. The representation of the digital here is entirely material. We see computer screens, hardware, memory boards, but also our artistic mechanical objects lighting up, whirring, or coming into being through women-identified hands-wielding tools. Other art created in the lab is intended to hack into larger discursive discourses, uh, structures, sorry. Um, artist and lab board member, member Patricia Rice, born in Lisbon but located in Vienna, for example, works with dual video channel installations specifically geared toward the interaction between bodies and open source technology particularly intimacy in the context of big data. In Zeichengruppe, a um, drawing group from 2017, Buschitz and collaborators Fabian Faltin focus on, on the traumatic experience of the wage laborer, incorporating termination emails and similar, sorry, and similar, um, sorry, incorporating termination emails and similar forms of oppressive communication into the video-based performance. The video is taken from a camera located at a fixed position, capturing the lab space and fast forward speed as participants sit down, offer their letters, join in drawing, or watch these in production by the artist team, the pile of finished product growing on the table. The resulting effect is one of an assembly line, transforming the laboring artist into a waste worker. A more recent example comes from the November 2019 performance workshop by Mary Magic called, with a nod to Valley Export, Genital, Genital Panic. At that workshop, the artist invited visitors to offer their bodies in the development of an anonymous digital database of 3D genital scans with the intention of disrupting the medical policing of binarism through the use of anogenital distance measuring. In a final example, the medium is the massage. Wuschitz plays on the famous statement by media theorist Marshall McLuhan to question how data is written into human bodies. The title cards draw lines between data and ideologies, demanding viewers situate their body in data and asking them to consider when people are treated like things in fascism, in patriarchy, in capitalism, or if algorithm structures massive amounts of decontextualized human actions. Those are some of the titles. The visual imagery depicts hands massaging skin covered in letters, represented by typeface or alphabet noodles, underscoring the materiality of data. We again view the labor of artistic practice, the body imprinted by a referent, not the digital itself. The text we see in this example on the body is Donna Haraway's famous, I would rather be a cyborg than a goddess. It may have, however, been more fitting to choose Jasbir Poir's 2012 reformulation of this famous claim, quote, would I really rather be a cyborg than a goddess? The former hails the future in a teleological, technological determinism culture. That seems not only overdetermined, but also exceptionalizes our current technologies. The latter, nature, is embedded in the racialized matriarchal mythos of feminist reclamation narratives. But why disaggregate the two when there surely must be cyborgian goddesses in our midst? That's what uh, Huar asked. Just such an assemblage may be an apt way of describing what this and other feminist hacker, hacker spaces gesture towards. And since we are at the 15 minute mark, I will take. Okay. So maybe I then raise a question. Um, sure. In regard to, to this relationship between body and data that uh, you were also presenting, especially when we look at the last example, or one of your last examples, which I think it was Mary Magic, um, and the scanning of body parts, and also thinking about this um, kind of uh, opposition that also referring to Pua, you know, uh, she's not a goddess and a cyborg. And you would say, are these two different body formations? Or how, how is the body then um, 
what is it? What what kind of relation is this? The one between body and that? Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that is the question, right? Um, yeah, and, that's right. <laughs> I mean, we'll see um, in the next uh, section, I will go into more deeply into two artists' works where that's very much about the body in, in different ways. And I think, um, you know, with, this is not an answer because hopefully we'll, we'll get towards, towards an answer as I, as I continue. Um, but what's interesting, I think um, I gave, uh, as I've said, these are the example portions, some of which I've been in other places. And at a recent talk um, I gave in Vancouver, I was talking about the, the, the Mary Magic um, example. And one of the participants asks, asked specifically, not about the relationship between data and the body, but actually about the relationship between data and the genital genitals. Why? Why the focus? You know, the the specific focus on the genitals and and problems. You know, around also in terms of trans activism, which was a really a, you know an important question. And I think um, what um, what I hope to achieve as this research, which is still completely in progress, um, as this research continues, is to about um, not necessarily answers to the questions, but what questions matter, right? Um, because I think what I'm what I'm trying to do is show that, in some ways, that like I said, the examples I'm pulling out are random. I could probably look and see what's out there. I know there are some. Um, hubs in and around uh, for feminist hacker spaces in and around Münster. Um, I'm sure there are quite a few at this point in Berlin. And as I said, who knows, there are probably many in, in and around Gießen um, because they pop up, right? Um, you could use anything as an example. The question is what kinds of questions arise? And I think the question of the body and data is really important, especially when we're thinking about current moment, which is something that I hope we can talk about at the end, because, um, you know, you're not using Zoom, maybe you've learned, the university has learned not to use Zoom, but the way in which, um, you know, information is being stored uh, virtually, and, and our bodies are becoming virtual bits of data through the Zoom is, is really um, an important thing to remember. So that's no answer, just uh, some connected thoughts. Thank you. Also, you might see that Daniel Heinz put some questions up on the chat room. And we also have a question by Sephora Mohulatsi. Sephora, are you there? <clears throat> Maybe you'd like to raise your question. Hello? Sephora? Well, she asks, why is Ms. Baltus's laboratory an example of digital feminism? Uh, because their focus is on the creation of um, digital objects and art that engages in the digital uh, creation, uh, in digital creation. And because of that, plus the mission statement of focusing on feminist, um, queer, uh, trans, um, and anti racist making. Um, that is why it would be in my, how I define digital feminism, um, an example of a, a collective, of a space for digital feminist um, activism. As I said at the beginning, digital feminist activism, almost solely in the research, referred to um, hashtag and social media activism. Um, and so I'm trying to move it away from that and not move it away add to that all the other types of digital work that uh, feminist um, creators are engaged in. Okay. Um, uh, is this the only example or can I use another example that can be used in terms of uh, digital feminism? So this is Sephora. Sephora, you might, yeah, maybe you say your name first before you talk so that we know who is talking right now. Could you say it again, please, the question? I was asking if this is the only example used in digital feminism or there can be another 
maybe examples in line with what you used before? In line with, I didn't hear the last two words. Uh, is this the only example used in digital feminism? Or maybe there are another examples that can be used uh, in line with digital feminism, like uh, the Balthazar Laboratory. Or this is the only. Oh, this is the only suitable example. No, absolutely not. Uh, I could. We could open uh, any social media feed um and use any examples what i'm what i'm trying to do and you'll see at the end that's why stopping in minute blocks is hard um you'll see at the end what i'm trying to do is say that um all of these examples create um not what i'm calling non-coalitional collaboration which is how do we think about all the different examples we could pull out how do we think about them together as working towards um, certain goals, right? How do we think about the activist impulses? Um, the problem with the digital world or digital research is I could, we could do anything. And anything I pull out as an example will already be outdated because the digital world, as we know, moves very, very quickly. Um, so no, this is not the only example. I am using the examples that I'm using here um, because as you heard from my bio, um, I'm a Germanist by training. And so the um, examples that I use come from some of that background, the German language background. Um, and there's many more in the German language background that I could be using, but I'm, these are just the ones I'm using, so no. There's lots out there, and I hope at the end we can talk a little bit uh, about the kinds of um, activist work that you are following or engaged in um, that might also be appropriate for thinking about um, what I'm trying to think about today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Are there more observations, questions? Okay, and let's continue. Okay, so um, we just discussed uh, creative works that are generated within the context, or maybe even we could say the safety of a collective. Um, there is something quite, uh, you know, in, enriching and, and um, safe, I guess, about um, that kind of a space. Um, I turn now to two very different artist mobilized works that stand in stark tension with one another. Um, again, as I sort of just said about Ms. Baitaza's laboratory, um, these two examples, these two artists, um, just happen to be artists that I've worked on for a while. Um, I could have used other examples, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but the idea is bringing these into tension. Um, so, um, oops, that's not what I meant to do. There we go. Aha. Um, so we will start with um, the creative works of German scholar, activist, and writer Noah So, which many of you know. Um, so works at the intersection of digital art, critical media analysis, Black German history, and feminist activism. In her artistic production, go, um, something with my screen. Um, in her artistic production, she utilizes the capabilities of the digital medium, not only as a means of creation and distribution, but also as a manner of performing what she calls historiography through storytelling. So artistic historiography tells the story of Black German identity and Afro-feminist knowledge production. In much of her work, she utilizes different aspects of the digital, whether as hardware or virtual capabilities, photo film, interactive objects, sound in installations, and live performance as such historiography. For example, in the photo film, Acts of Wellness from 2014, um, the artist presents the accounts of four women who document their experience committing acts of wellness as resistance to a white neoliberal neoliberal culture of luxury, which otherwise dominates and dictates the commodified wellness industry. 
The film combines still photographs from the women's disposable cameras with a voiceover, which narrates their answers to a series of interview questions. The uh, photo film also highlights the dearth of images of black women when searching for wellness. Um, here, um, it might be useful to look in, uh, into the algorithms of oppression, of course. These are the algorithms that drive what we see. And while Acts of Wellness is a digital video, it draws on the tools of analog photography. Extreme close-ups of exposed film strips of film accentuate the juxtaposition of the analog and digital, actual and virtual. The grainy and fuzzy representations they produce evade consumerist and voyeuristic images of a black female body. Citing Bell Hooks' statement that, quote, choosing wellness is an act of political resistance that promotes self-recovery from structural violence for black women, the film responds to the constant and often precarious labor required of black women in Germany, Europe, and around the world by engaging them in an experiment of not being productive, at least in the terms set by the global economy. In other installations, so it shows how black bodies are always visible. Of restrooms, which you see here, and I was going to put the uh, video, there's a really um, great documentary video footage on, on Vimeo um, for those who haven't seen this before. Um, restrooms, which is a sound installation in which only her hands are projected onto a large screen as she works with a digital console elsewhere. She writes, quote, I perform away from the gaze of the audience, for in such a setting, my body cannot be watched without being marked, and I must not be marked in such a setting. She calls the installation a performance Harry? of Black German Den. Yeah? Um, did you want to share your presentation with us, or? Did it stop? Oh, we goodness. Can't see it Thank you for, uh, I, I, uh, that would have been, uh, I knew something weird happened. No. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for, for letting me know. Um, so here, image of Acts of Wellness. Here is a screenshot from Acts of Wellness. Uh, search here that you um, see uh, when searching for wellness and the uh, dearth of, of black bodies in that search. And here we are with restrooms. So thank you for noting that. I was going to do the video. Good thing. Good thing I didn't. So here's just the screenshot. Um, so she says here of this, I perform away from the gaze of the audience for in such a setting, my body cannot be watched without being marked and I must not be marked in such a setting. She calls the installation a performance of Black German identity as presence and absence. In a different variation of the installation, more than rest, she, quote, hopes to inspire other artists to seek for speaking positions that interrupt the European sense of entitlement to immediate and physical access to Black bodies. Being unavailable is an affront to normality. The Black female artist's physical withdrawal considered an uppity act of aggression. So's work here forges a connection to the aesthetic and political project and history of women of color feminism, which, as Fatima Adhaya has written, emphasizes a messy use of vernacular forms to find a new language for making visible intersectional positionalities. This new language is spoken here in this work through digital connectors, the body retreating into the hardware. So now I'm going to shift to a radically uh, different example. Again, one that um, I assume you are all familiar with, potentially. Um, and that, uh, but it still continues to rest on the question of the visibility of bodies. And that is Germany-based, Swiss-born, self-stylized artivist, Milo Moire. And I turn to her, I have to note, not because I think her art is particularly good, um, but rather because I think it highlights some of the messy complications that I'm trying to unfold. Her street-based performances are trained at the digital. Her videos appear primarily in the virtual world of her three websites, the English and German language versions of uh, milomoire.com and the pay-per-view website unlimitedmuse.com. Further, they are very program programmatically seek to undermine three dominant cultural narratives, the autonomy of the naked female body, the male dominated art word, world, and the virtual self. In This Is Not a Naked Woman um, from 2017, for example, the nude artist walks through various locations of Documenta 14, 
wearing a virtual reality headset containing an embedded iPhone, which records her movements while also delivering further information on the art pieces and her physical coordinates. Facebook viewers are invited to watch the live video and simultaneously take part in the event through additional commentary. And I should note, she was not part of the documenta. This is sort of uh, uh, an action, um, an activist action. Um, we view the words, this is not a naked woman, written above her breasts and by, uh, in French and binary code on her bottom. Her body intervenes multiply by traversing the gallery spaces of the documenta indoors and then outdoors. This is a rather long video. Um, nude, she attempts to trouble the notion of acceptable art as it is presented by dominant adjudication and curatorial mechanisms. The reference to René Magritte's famous, this is not a pipe, draws that lineage backwards through masculinized art history. However, by linking this artistic legacy to her naked body, as well as to virtual and social media worlds, she suggests that her own body, itself quite enhanced, is much like augmented reality. Are we all wearing those, these glasses, seems to be the underlying question. On the website framing this piece in English, we read the following intervention. Quote, how is the public space changing? As the digital space now replaces or alternatively reshapes the public space, as the digital nude superimposes itself over the optical nude, is the reproduction and distribution in digital space triggering a disintegration in real space? People are connected in real time in front of their screens and take in additional information which goes beyond their eyes. The real body is shifting into digital space. Will this result in our isolating ourselves within augmented reality? paradoxically feeling trapped in our bodies through this expansion, or will we finally dissolve the body beyond recognition within the digital space? So you see, it's very programmatic. And these questions suggest an interest in pushing the connection between the experience of art as representation and our experience of our online lives, the artist's naked body acting as a mechanism of transfer between these worlds. A similar interest is seen in an earlier performance piece, Naked Selfies, from 2015, during which she invited tourists to take selfies with her on central squares throughout Europe and post these to social media, claiming that by using her own naked body as a, quote, self-exposing avatar, she establishes, quote, a point of contact between the real and the digital revelation of intimacy. Uh, one final example in the mirror box from 2016-17, which my collaborator Maria Stela and I discuss in, discussed in a recent issue of Ada, Moray restages Austrian performance artist Valerie Export. Here's an image from that uh, famous um, performance, Tap and Touch Cinema, as a comment on consent after Cologne. Export uh, debuted the performance in Vienna during a film festival that took place on the 11th of November, 1968. At that festival, Export's film, Ping Pong, received the prize for the most politically engaged film. But instead of screening the prize-winning film, she screened Tap and Touch Cinema, wearing a styrofoam box with curtains around her upper body. She invited viewers on the screen, street to reach in through the mini cinema's curtains to feel her naked breasts. In the video and photo documentation of the performance, Export's blank gaze meets the leering faces of the men placing their hands in the box. She opened the performance with a statement, quote, woman is a central theme of film, but film must leave the cinema, be brought among the people. This statement leverages a leftist understanding that film, to be political, must reach the people by reflecting ongoing social realities. However, by literally bringing film to the people when she performed Tap and Touch Cinema in the street among pedestrians, Export uncovered the broad-based willingness in society to engage in acts of sexual violence. However, by connecting the action within the space of a film festival, the piece also questions the film's potential for being a measure of our experience with the world, as well as its ability to produce the politics that the Malasiada uh, Junger Film and other leftist festivals and organizations purported to foster. In Ware's reprise, and I have to um, warn here that this, these, these images are um, somewhat explicit, although they are um, uh, X'd out, uh, as you will see. Um, in Ware's reprise, there we go, 
the mirror box comprised of the bosom box and the vagina box. The curtains are made of red velvet and the box is made of mirrors with embedded recording cameras. The performances, while also taking place in the street, are created for internet dissemination. The video itself and the now virtual body is the creative object, not the moment, uh, the moment of performance per se. On her English language website, Moiré describes the mirror box as a mirror of consent, asking, quote, what happens when a woman puts her sexuality on public display? Assertively takes the initiative and lays out clear rules for the intimate interaction. Moray claims further that, quote, the audience's reflection on the mirrored box simultaneously becomes a visual metaphor for the role reversal from voyeur to the object of view, a constant play of inversions analogous to our roles in the digital world. On YouTube, which is the platform she uses to embed video in her two free sites, the mirror box has been censored with an overlaid ubiquitous black bar, which we see here, rendering it pornographic. A visual marker placing it within the context of other soft porn videos on this and other streaming channels. While touch is invited and consensual, the public fingering of Mora's breasts or vagina in a box nonetheless alludes to porn, booths, and unwanted public touch without explicitly thematizing these references. Further, its digital representation undermines the assertion that the performer maintains control over the rules of the intimate interaction that Moray lays out. Underscoring this paradox, on her parallel site, unlimitednews.com, uncensored versions of this and other pieces may be viewed for a monthly fee, 49 euros for one month, though you save 39% if you buy a three-month membership, 56%. The layout of this site, as we see here, replicates other feminist porn sites, such as brightdesire.com or the crowdsourced Make love, not porn, uh, not TV. And all this not to mention the soft porn thrust of her Facebook site. The place where, I remind you, audience members are to participate in live artistic interventions. It could be argued that Moray takes control in a feminist entrepreneurial manner of the circulation of pornographic imagery and commodification of women online, pocketing the sales as artist, actor, businesswoman. However, because the video replicates the version shown for free on YouTube, including the accompanying activist text, but removes the black bar, so we get all the politics, but we also get all the genitals, the question as to whether the uncensored video serves politics or sexual and financial pleasure goes unanswered. Not to mention that the entire script seems masterminded by her partner, Peter Palm, who's a self-proclaimed prestigious photographer who sits behind and the camera videotaping his muse. The straightforward critique of sexual object objectification and consent in the wake of Cologne is thus blurred, particularly when the performer's white and cosmetically enhanced body is considered in tandem with the ensuing racist vitrolic. Whiteness and racism insert themselves firmly into the conversation on pleasure and consent in messy ways. Practices emerge that exceed the geopolitical and epistemological boundaries of violence reminding that bodies are differently vulnerable to violence and the power to, de to determine the rules of consent is unequally distributed and never fixed. And here, this is my last sort of example from the artistic world, so I'm going to stop here before I bring all of this together um, with one more example and then all of this together in, in a theoretical a discussion of the structure. So I'll stop here. and see if there are questions. Oh, and Kana, I think you're muted. Um, thank you very much for this part. It, it was quite intense, and I think you also brought up different theoretical questions. And I would suggest that we do a five minute break so everyone can think through the, uh, through the images you have presented and also your comments. I think one important question is uh, what kind of body is being presented here in different art settings, and also how does this relate to the kind of non corporeality, uh, thinking the non substantial body in digital, in the digital. Yeah? So that's one claim that's being done. It's not what we know 
is the real body. It's the kind of mediated through digital kind of networks, uh, recreation. It's, it's cyborg, you know? If everyone knows the term of uh, Donna Haraway, cyborg, the kind of mixture between the human and the machine. So it's not anymore this human, it's something else. You know? It's a kind of simulacrum or something else. I think maybe if you think about it, what do we think about it? Also this uh, tension between what is the political when one is an activist, you know? it's doing kind of digital feminist activism. Uh, as the last example of Mare uh, shows, um, is this a, a political act or is this also reflecting kind of the social relations we have, also of power, economic relations, uh, commodification of bodies? So maybe think about those questions. And also the last, another aspect you also brought into it is the kind of intersections between race, you know, um, economy, um, sexuality. So think about that. So how does it erase also can kind of intersection? So it is like that place of intersectionality. But how can this medium also reproduce very kind of, uh, uh, let's say, unitarian ideas, you know, of whiteness, of how the feminine body should look like. But also, uh, the last point is also the kind of pornographic Gains, you know? um, how is it really challenged through a feminist digital lens? You know? um, so you have different kind. this is my proposal, and you also brought our new questions that we have on the chat room, um, okay. and also, of course, the whole presentation. So please think through it, and let's have a five minutes break. Uh, you can use the chat room for uh, phrasing your questions. As I say, you can also... Uh, use German, so you can use English or German to formulate the questions. And let's have a, let's have a five minutes break. So we're meeting in five minutes. Yeah. Okay. It's four o'clock, so four or five. Okay. Sounds Thank you, Carrie, good. for this part. And you can also switch off your cameras at the moment. Okay. There are several questions here. Um, mm -hmm. We have one from Dave Timani. Dave, are you there? So let's wait if he comes back. Um, well, I can just briefly, because I am looking at the chat here. Um, yeah, you see it too, yeah. Yeah, I just will briefly say that's actually exactly where we're going <laughs> after this. In my last section, I will start talking about um, bullies and, and trolls. So, um, yeah, sort of exactly um, a bit that I will I will address. Okay, so there is also a question by Sebastian. Sebastian, you're there. Yes, hello. Yeah. You? Okay. Hi, Sebastian. Hi. Just switch on my camera. Hi, everyone. And hi, Carrie. Thanks for the very interesting input. Um, yeah, the question is about the, uh, the Wet's Witten in, in Canada that have been taking place last year, particularly. And I was just wondering if you could like share more information about the digital, digital activism, because I found it quite interesting that it became so, uh, so prominent um, across the globe, at least um, uh, in the context where, where I've been working in the last years. And also, I would be interesting in the in the role of indigenous women in that context, particular in the in the use of um, digital media, online protests, etc. Um, that's a huge. That's a really important question, and it's a it's a huge topic that I feel um, myself not um, not adequate. I I don't think I can do it justice, but I will try a tiny bit. Um, the uh, it's interesting that you ask about the Wet'suwet'en because I actually had a section um, on their work uh, that I took out for today's talk. <laughs> um, uh, but what I think is really interesting about that moment, I mean, there's the, the activism, 
what, what we really see in that example, um, and I think it, we see it in the other examples too, it's sort of what, um, uh, where the, the questions were going before the break, the, the, the thinking, the thinking we were supposed to be doing. And that is the relationship between the, the physical bodies on the ground, right? Um, and how the movement is then translated and um, gains transnational importance through, through digital means, right? So everything that I've talked about uh, up to this point, and the Wet'suwet'en um, showed this very well, um, all the actions that are being under, undertaken are all about things that are happening physically in the world around us, right? In the case of the Wet'suwet'en, what I think is really interesting is how um, the localized um, actions grew then along, and if we're thinking infrastructures, along the infrastructure of the train lines in particular, right? And those train lines were then stopped, and the, the digital maps that were being shared around the different kinds of activist points draw a new um, infrastructural line, basically a line of transit of communication um, that instead of the trains moving oil and goods and coal and things like that, we had activist bodies connecting um, dots across Canada. Um, so I haven't thought much further than that. I think it's a really extremely important example. And it's an important example that reminds us how um, even though we think of digital activism and digital media as transnational, which it is, um, it's also extremely dependent on local content. Right? Um, so in the Milo More example, sure, there's, we can read some of the issues about how she's investing her body and, and using her body to do certain things. But if we're localizing it within the context of Cologne specifically, it gains an entirely different um, resonance, which is the same, I think, when we're thinking about Wet'suwet'en and the land rights and, and experiences. So, um, so yes, I'm just agreeing with you and saying that's a really good example. When it comes to other Indigenous activism, um, I have not um, done as much work in, um, in that arena, precisely because one thing I learned about doing the editorial work on the Indigenous Studies and German Studies issue, one thing I learned is um, it's so important not to do this work without Indigenous collaborators. And those Indigenous collaborators are stretched very thin. Um, they have a lot, of, uh, a lot of work and a lot of people pulling at them in different ways. So that can be very difficult and one has to be really mindful of that. Um, one of the places that I think the um, uh, work is really interesting is, of course, around the missing and murdered Indigenous women of, of Canada, um, or of what is now known as Canada. That uh, it digital, um, the digital activism there is really important. Another really good example, which I don't draw on here, but I think would provide a an exciting dimension to to this project, are the Indigenous. Um, uh, the Sami activism in uh, Scandinavia and the Sami yoke that they're using uh, YouTube um, and music to uh, engage in activism in really interesting and creative ways. I don't know enough about it other than that it exists um, because I haven't delved into that um, side of things, but that's also another really interesting place in which um, YouTube specifically is being used as an Thank you. There's a comment by Marco. Marco? Can you hear me? Marco? Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, today my camera isn't working. Yeah. Um, I don't have any questions. Um, I just wrote that I'm really impressed of this new perspective I haven't known before about digital feminism. And especially, I wanted to. Uh, yeah, be thankful for your sensitive and conscious introduction. Um, and then, um, yeah, just get a sense of what could examples in general mean. And that's why I was, um, I found it really good that you also explained that that that's 
uh, just samples, but it could have been different ones. And um, in that context also, um, I understood that as uh, quick as um, some sort of performance in digital feminism could pop up, it could even, um, yeah, just kind of pop off. I don't know if it's the right mm -hmm. word, but um, sounds good to me. Really, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are no questions, it's just a comment. Yeah, I think um, that's a really good point. It's it's what's very difficult um, is the question of why certain things pop up and stay and why other things disappear within 48 hours, why some things travel and go viral and why other things don't. Um, and uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm not that kind of a media scholar. I'm a, a, a cultural studies media scholar, so I, I, I'm sure there's research out there. But I do think it's a really interesting question because you're right. Um, some of these things remain, um, and some are are just, you know, the hashtag of the moment. Yeah, that's also what I've uh, heard in another um, discussion. Like, what are these? Why are the examples which kind of made it in a certain mainstream way? Why has it happened like this? <laughs> and it's, I think, really, really hard to um, yeah, understand it. And maybe it's even not so important. It's just a case of focus on okay, what's happening right now. Thank you. There's also a question by Sifora Mohulatsi. Sifora? Uh, you can read the question. Sifora, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Would you like to comment on it, on your question? Uh, actually, I need some clarity on my question. Uh, uh, like I already asked, um, Moray's Asian Social Constructed, was there something, okay, I'm currently working on my research based on gender studies. Uh, I'm doing my research on uh, sexuality and Beauty pageants. So uh, there's a thing that I came across. Apparently, uh, beauty is socially constructed. I'm not gonna indulge more on that. Uh, um, just want to ask: um, belong race action also socially constructed? Is this how she deals even with challenges of? Social, social health standards and stereotypes mm -hmm. about the dynamics of body images. Yeah, just, 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 yeah, I think that's all for me. Yeah, I, I absolutely think you're, um, you're right. I think that that's um, what she is trying to do, challenging societal standards and stereotypes. Um, because, of course, these are absolutely um, socially constructed. Where I believe it gets complicated is how then this challenge that she's presenting, when it's then embedded in the digital world, it kind of, um, you know, in some ways, she loses control. Right. And this is where we'll go in a second in the comment section in the screenshot I showed on Facebook. I mean, if you go to her Facebook site, um, if you're on Facebook, you can see that the comments are solely sexual in nature. And, you know, oh, my goodness, baby, you look amazing, that sort of thing. And um, and so and she doesn't engage with that. So the question is. What is happening? <laughs> is is she really challenging these socially constructed um, standards and stereotypes, or or is there something else at work also? And it might be yes and, and it might be both of that, um, and that's that's sort of um, where it where it gets complicated. But I think that's a really good point around you know beauty. What constitutes beauty? I mean, clearly. She is um, undergone a lot of surgery, and um, and is is not shy about that. And so there are ways in which we should be questioning exactly what we think is beautiful. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. So I would say we continue then with the third part. Thank you, Carrie. Sure. Thank you. All right. Um, so the one last example I wanted to bring in is no longer about art, but actually about this issue of the comment section. Um, because what I'm trying to address in my work is exactly this messy interface between activist impulses and then everything else that's going on uh, going on online um, and the ways in which this is not um, not something that can be uh, well controlled maybe it shouldn't um, so what I'm calling the comment section what does it mean when that unequal distribution of power that I, I sort of was talking about that I think we see in the very different examples of so and Moray um, the unequal distribution of power, the harassment, violence, and the backlash to a lot of this, we haven't talked about the backlash, um, become more than part of the research. Multiple national and international organizations show that women and LGBTQIA2 spirit folks are more likely to be target of online harassment than cisgendered white men. That's just um, reality. This can range from more general bullying and unpleasant attacks by trolls and more violent threats of rape and physical harm, often of a sexualized nature. Trolling can cause people to remove themselves from conversations and to withdraw from online life. Harassment takes trolling one step further and intentionally looks to do damage. It can cause people to lose jobs and lives, um, such things you've probably heard and, and engage with questions of doxing. Women, LGBTQIA2S people, um, people of color, et cetera, are targeted specifically because of their offline identities. And again, um, there is no such thing in this world as uh, digital feminism without street feminism. It is, um, they are part and parcel of one another. Both trolls and harassers work to find ways in which to identify the gender, sexuality, or race of the target through usernames, photos, language used, Facebook groups, and other means to then specifically target individuals. Through hashtags, harassment becomes mobilized into large-scale mobs. And while more powerful women, that is women taking up prominent roles in politics, business, sports, etc., receive an average of 200 abusive tweets a day, according to a very scientific Forbes study, and can mean loss of career, when we are speaking of women in more precarious situations, the removal of oneself from online life can mean loss of access to information, loss of participation in public life, of community, and ultimately loss of life. When speaking in this context of women and women-identified persons, this abuse almost always turns around sexualization, as I said. There is no such thing as a split between online and real-world experience experiences for digital feminist activist work and research, for it is the real threat of sexual violence that informs women's experience of online intrusion. The verbal ejaculation of street harassment becomes ebile or online misogynistic language. Uh, a quote from um, internet researcher Vera Gray, on reflection, the tension between freedom and safety that acts to restrict women's freedom of movement in physical public spaces in order to increase their feelings of safety is replicated in online public space where women's freedom of speech is inhibited through men's intrusive practices. Thus, we are not merely looking at technology-facilitated sexual violence and harassment, or TFSV, which describes a range of harmfully sexually aggressive of behaviors perpetuated against women with the aid of new technologies. If it were that simple, it would be the technology that is the problem. Fix the technology, remove the harassment. But it is the social context that enables such violence, just as it is the governmental and neoliberal context that provides the frame for the breach of consent. Technology isn't the problem, but neither is the target. The problem becomes when we talk about staying safe as a woman, as a queer or racialized activist or researcher, we replicate the culture of victim blaming, asking the woman, in this case, to be, in, in the case of my example here, in this case, to be responsible for avoiding harassment or sexual assault. We perpetuate the victim narrative and thereby perpetuate the culture. And this has become, yet again, in our current moment, increasingly apparent um, when it comes to Zoom bombing, because um, Zoom bombers have targeted, of course, also um, 
racialized uh, queer uh, individuals and women. It becomes further convoluted when digital theft is both the method and the object of research because the researcher um, themself, uh, themselves becomes uh, implicated. Feminist researchers doing work online must already fold the labor of addressing their own harassment and safety into the research methodology. This brings about numerous questions related to the question of methodology. Being a researcher on feminist scholar activism in the digital realm, that is, I also look at the ways in which scholars engage in activism online, because that's a whole other dimension of um, feminist uh, online activism. Does that necessitate that I also become an activist? Is research activism? And when does it become activism? If I or in my work, which is visible online and being personally attacked, do I myself become a subject of my own research? And that through these attacks, the necessity of feminist activism on and offline is confirmed. The hidden labor of the digital feminist researcher becomes part of the story. Thought in this manner, Techniques of staying safe online becomes a story of resistance and resilience. So there is something wholly discomforting about Moray's performances when we consider their digital embeddedness alongside So's work, the celebratory safe space of Ms. Baitazar's laboratory, in the greater soup of feminist hashtag activism from Aus Nam's Los to Me Too, not to mention the comment section, as I've just outlined. How do we think these diverse communities and objects together, and maybe more importantly, why? Digital feminisms are in the business of world building. They imagine emerging worlds for a more socially just future beyond sexual violence, gender normativity, and racism, both on and offline. These worlds include not only activists, artists, and makers, but also all sorts of objects that themselves add, as well as clicks, comments, likes, and responses. They are populated by various modes of embodiment, as we've seen and talked about, by videos and media-based installations, by rejigged and demasculinized hardware and tools, by new codes and programs, all of which become activists gathering agency, moving between visceral and virtual worlds, as colors of feminist political impulses, including and excluding, um, or being with and being without. These objects we could think of as boundary objects, a concept introduced by media scholar Susan Lee Starr in 1988-89 to interrogate how groups of people might work together collaboratively where there is no, no consensus. A boundary is a shared space or a community of practice where, exact, quote, where exactly that sense of here and there are confounded. An object is something people, or in computer science or other objects and programs, act toward and with. Its materiality derives from action, not from a sense of prefabricated stuff or thingness. Objects are the stuff of action. Thus, boundary objects are objects or concepts that are common enough for shared understanding, but also flexible and expandable for emergent thinking. Star gives an example of a map in the hands of campers and geologists, respectively. That same map does two different things if you're going to find a campsite or if you're going to dig, uh, uh, dig and look at rock formations, but it may be the very same map. A boundary object is also a set of work arrangements across communities. Many feminist media scholars have taken up boundary objects in a number of useful ways seeing them to be, as Jessica Wernemont and Elizabeth Lush write, quote, plastic, interpreted differently, and adapted to express emergent thinking across communities and contexts while also maintaining sufficient conceptual integrity uh, for common understanding. A boundary object thinks for concepts, people, in relation with one another for organizing, organization and work through a shared yet divergent understanding of utility or meaning. In a final step of the process of working relation, quote, found objects begin to move and change into infrastructure. There's been a growing interest over the past few years in thinking about infrastructures more expansively than streets, waterways, social services, such as hospitals and distribution pipelines. Though again, in this current moment, we see how important those kinds of infrastructures are as well, naturally. For digital environments, the focus is on how infrastructures, quote, 
reconfigure the sense of and possibility for acts of connection and the felt experience of connectedness. This from uh, colleague Deb Verhoeven. Infrastructure becomes a form of mediation, of inventiveness and interpretive resourcefulness, and a creative process and a catalyst of social amenity. Because infrastructures are expansive in their logic, they challenge traditional patterns of knowledge, community, and geography. Doing so by directing attachments and meanings through multiplying chains of connection, offering us the sense that there is another way of living. But connections are social relations. In keeping with the popularity of the term, in January 2019, Transmediale, the art and digital culture festival operating out of Berlin, turns its, turned its sights to effective infrastructures as a way to understand how contemporary technologies capture emotions and control bodies. They mediate and regulate life. In creating infrastructures, as the uh, study circle, a transmediale study circle um, uh, engaged in, affect is, quote, destabilized and channeled, manufactured and circulated. Of course, all um, infrastructures, effective or not, direct attachments and meaning, leading us through chains of connections in a persistent and ongoing manner. Putting these things together, boundary objects can create a shared methodological framework for approaching the lived experience and actions, the organization and work of the ever expanding different communities that make up digital feminism, while also offering a manner of thinking about a possible infrastructure for shared political sustainability. If we consider digitally born boundary objects as a means of creating collaboration among visceral and virtual communities of practice, existing without a consensus around what feminist politics mean, what they do, what form activist action must take, or even the means and ends, we must establish how these communities come into contact without actually coming into contact. They do so, I argue, through the effective pull generated by, in the examples I've given, the mobilization of the body. These affects, in turn, build an infrastructure built not of bricks and mortar, but of the physical, emotional, and relational resonances generating, generated among common boundary objects, acting as political agents, which allows us to think methodologically about digital feminist ecosystems as non-coalitional collaboration. But the why remains. What utility is there in thinking about digital feminism in this manner? In a 2016 essay, which is part of the 2020 forthcoming book on the inconvenience of other people, Lauren Berlant, and some of you may have looked at this essay, uses infrastructure to think through terms of sociality with a focus not on belonging, which is a key concept that often arises in thinking about activist movements, of course, belonging to a certain but on proximity. Specifically interested in infrastructural failure, the breakdown of resource distribution, social relations, but also the failure of solidarity patterns in grassroots movements, she thinks through how we might repair broken infrastructure to extend sociality, thereby also developing a, quote, concept of structure for a transitional time, which she calls the glitch of the present, which feels very apt at the moment. She defines infrastructure as the movement or patterning of social, social form, the life world of structure, and that which binds us to the world in movement and keeps the world practically bound to itself through patterns, habits, and norms. Thinking about how to transition into patterning social form differently to address ongoing emergencies, many of which are defined by movement or non-movement of bodies, where bodies get stuck, also allows us to provide conceptual infrastructures, not only as ideas, but also as part of the protocols or practices that hold, up, hold the world up, hold the world up, that's her land phrase. She continues, Given newly intensified tensions, anxieties, and antipathies, again, she's writing in 2016 uh, in the context of Trump. Um, given the newly intensified tensions, anxieties, and antipathies at all levels of intimate abstraction, the question of politics becomes identical with the reinvention of infrastructures for managing the unevenness, ambivalence, violence, and ordinary contingency of contemporary existence. In this essay, Berlant is thinking through terms of transition and how these impact infrastructures of sociality. Hence, the essay's focus on the commons and its pedagogies. Sociality understood not as belonging, but as proximity. She places her emphasis on where things stop moving or stop reproducing. Quote, 
So we can see the glitch of the present as a revelation of what had been the lived ordinary, the common infrastructure. When things stop converging, they also threaten the conditions and the sense of belonging, but more than that, of assembly. Failure and collapse, the glitch, allow for a disturbance in old logic and ways of doing and assembling. I am interested in how affect generated by disparate digital feminisms build an infrastructure that enables movement, where activism is action, movement, across groups or spheres of practice, but in a way that holds space also for the ambivalence and strange resistance inherent in the non-coalitional, the discomforting, and unease. Those glitches and collapses in the old way of doing things. And here I think again of the complications that uh, Moray's work brings up. Instead of thinking about belonging, I, in keeping with Berlant, am thinking of digital feminist proximity as a way of addressing political relationality. Berlant closes her essay with the following um, rather complicated quote. What remains is to build effective infrastructures that admit the work of desire as the work of aspirational ambivalence. What remains is the potential we have to common infrastructures that absorb the blows of our aggressive need for the world to accommodate us and our resistance to adaptation, and that, at the same time, hold out the prospect of a world worth attaching to that's something other than old hope's bitter echo. And here, I think that we discussed a little bit the Wet'suwet'en um, example in the break, and I think um, that is a really good example for thinking through um, the complexities that uh, Berlant here is, is talking about in this quote, that we, you know, we, we have this aggressive need for the world to accommodate us, i.e. we need oil in the pipeline, but, and resisting adaptation in a way that yet we would like to hope that there's another world that we're, that's worth attaching to. And I think that the Wet'suwet'en example um, really, really shows that ambivalence, the, the difficulty in, in addressing that. And that's especially important given um, my context at the University of Alberta, when the price of oil tanks, um, uh, so too does the funding for the university. So all these things are bound up together. As I write this discussion of infrastructures, I can't help but think also, of course, about the current moment. To what world are we attaching now and when we emerge? This is the question that must be asked also of activist and social justice work if infrastructures of the kind I'm thinking about here are to transform our connectedness in any meaningful way. So in my research, just briefly in conclusion, I look at building a shared methodological framework for approaching the lived experience and actions, the organization work of the ever expanding different communities that make up digital feminism, while also offering a manner of thinking about a possible infrastructure for shared political sustainability. And I'd like to add to that, of course, shared political accountability. Important. Digital feminist communities are fluid and ill-defined. Their objects and agents are in constant flux, and it really depends on who's sharing what and who's liking what. The common object, whether that is a common goal or a common enemy, delineates the boundary between or puts up a loose perimeter around communities of practice. In my brief overview of what is at stake in digital feminist activism when thought of as communities of practice, as digitally born creative production, and as the comment section, I have attempted to bring divergent laborers into collaboration, uh, laborers that probably have never talked to one another. If digital feminisms are in the business of world building, that process must be understood to leave us with a quote from my colleague, again, Deb Verhoeven, quote, not as the production of a future world to replace this one, but as the radical transformation of the world in which we already Thank you, Kerry. Stop sharing this if I can figure it yeah. out. So um, we are over our time <laughs> now. So we some needed to leave because um, we schedule it until uh, 4.30. And so um, I would say that we take two questions. So. Other questions, especially in regard to the last points.
Um, yes, um, thank you so much for your talk. It was amazing listening to those new insights. Um, what I'm interested in is to think um, how these digital infrastructures relate to state policies and state regulations and to what extent um, we have to think about new emerging forms of state power that try to interfere in digital activism. Um, what, what do you think about the state in relation to feminist digital spaces? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, what's really, of course, gets complicated is um, we talked a little bit uh, in one of the breaks about the way in which the um, the local always figures into, into these activist concerns. And, of course, one of those um, local uh, issues is... Um, is state regulation absolutely um, one? It was interesting. I, I don't have a good answer because that's not an area I've researched much in. Um, but um, I gave a talk in the context of a um, conference on um, Russia's intervention in Ukraine um, related to digital media and the ability to. Um, uh, for free flow of information. Um, and what was really interesting to me there is that that, again, is not something I have thought a whole lot about. Um, and the questions were radically different than those I get in um, Western European and North American contexts, right? Where we often, even though we're also being regulated, we're not thinking about it as much. We're not, it's not as visible, right? Um, and so that was really, that was really interesting to me. It's absolutely part of the, um, it's absolutely part of the conversation. My, in the work that I do, I look primarily to more popular forms, um, because also some of my research comes out of pop feminism. Uh, but of course, state regulation um, in certain national contexts means a lot of this activism has to happen on different types of platforms that are not easily accessible, right? We think, of course, of Hong Kong um, and the protests in Hong Kong over the past year um, around uh, university, um, et cetera, and that had a lot to do with uh, activism that was generated online, but in places where um, people don't often come across. So there's a really, I think, um, interesting question to be made around um, the public sphere and what are the public spheres in this context, right? And the regulations that are involved. It's a really good point. Sorry, my internet is not always working. But I would say because uh, people are living uh, already um, that we like for, to thank you for this great and wonderful and inspiring talk. I hope you can, can you still hear me? I mm -hmm. see it's kind of uh, intermittent at the moment, the connection. So it's, you gave us a lot of uh, observations and questions to tackle on and uh, um, we could go on and on uh, for hours discussing, especially the, the question of infrastructure as a kind of political um, underpinning of these very heterogeneous practices, you know, looking at everyday practices. I, I know the discussions in Spain or Argentina on infrastructure very much related right now also at the moment at how within being in confinement, you still can connect to your neighbors, you still can circulate food, you still can circulate uh, very material, basic um, aims of support. So uh, and the idea of common is something that has to do with this very kind of basic practices of creating um, common networks in a situation mm -hmm. where actually partition goes on or divisions goes on. No? The whole debate about the privatization of life through digital, through the digital. No? So we are all sitting at home at the moment, which is great. But at the same time, of course, how do we work also with this new dimension. I mean, not new, it's, it's actually not anymore new. It's part of our lives. 
and, and the kind of activism that goes on. And you talk about the feminism on the street. And I think this kind of connection is very, very important. Do not lose track of uh, the kind of physical uh, space and, and what it means then to create sustainability, but also be accountable for the historical context. You mentioned Canada, you mentioned Canada. It's an uh, unceded territory of uh, First Nation people and all the different kind of contexts we move on. No, um, mm -hmm. You also raised the point of racism and the attack uh, against feminists also in Germany, gender studies scholars, feminist scholars, but also black women, women of color, which being online is always a very dangerous thing to do. So everyone needs to think, is that what I really like to do? So. Um, Think, but it's a lot of things of at the same time, of course, a lot of different um, networks of communication and, and interventions happen and you show us so many of them. So thank you. So it's a wonderful and great work you're doing. Uh, very inspiring. I'm looking forward <laughs> to your public your publications and, and also uh, I, we will continue in discussing your work and, uh, and your presentation. Uh, with the students. Next week there will be Pinar to school, so she will in a way take over some of, uh, or not take over, but ex explore some of the ideas. And let me thank you again. It's it's really great you were you make time for us and uh, yeah. But stay stay here while everyone can <laughs> leave. Okay. I'm here. So thank you again. Very much. Okay, so please feel free now to leave the, the WebEx meeting.